Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Spieth. I am the chair of the Military Officers Education Committee, which also serves as the committee for the Nemes Lecturership. And on behalf of the committee and on behalf of the Department of Naval Science, welcome to the 28th Nimitz Lectureship Series, the second lecture thereof tonight. I'm also here, of course, to welcome Ahmad Rashid. I suspect that most people were here on Tuesday night and already heard the biography, but in case somebody was not there, I'll make just a few quick comments that uh, Mr. Rashid has had a very distinguished career as a reporter and an author primarily, as his primary career, <clears throat> with of course his focus on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. He's a native and a resident of Pakistan. However, he combines that with a British education, followed by 10 years as a guerrilla fighter, they describe it in the publications, on the western hills of Pakistan. When he completed that indenture, he had credentials for becoming a correspondent in Afghanistan and Pakistan that few of any other people in the world have had and have had access and has understanding to places where the rest of us can only think about possibly going if we so choose. As a result of all this, he has for well over 20 years been the correspondent for various uh, publications, primarily the Daily Telegraph and also the Far Eastern Economic Reviews. You can find essays by him in the New York Review of Books, in the Wall Street Journal, The Nation, The Daily Times of Pakistan, and I'm not sure how other many places. Also, you may have seen him on television or listened on radio, on networks such as CNN, uh, NPR, where he was on just yesterday morning at 7 a.m., and BBC World, for example. And he has also written a number of books, probably the most famous being Taliban, Militant Islam, Oil and Fundamentalism in Central Asia. That was published in the year 2000. It talked about the Taliban in a way the rest of the world had no clue. In 2001, the rest of the world got a clue, and his book became sort of the, uh, the main textbook, if you will, for trying to understand who these people calling themselves the Taliban are. His most recent book, I should and ask him, sir, when is it actually coming out? They say the month of March. This is the month of March. Today. Today he has out a new book with the title Pakistan on the Brink. <coughs> the captain is holding it. The Future of America, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. There are several comments I'd like to make about having invited him to be our Nimitz lecturer. First, he is the fourth in a new tradition that we have had of having names for Nimitz lecturers be proposed by the midshipmen and cadets to our Nimitz lectureship committee. So our speakerships start with the midshipmen and cadets. And he can close his ears, midshipmen and cadets, this has been a selling point to all four speakers that you have recommended to us. Every year they have repeatedly said, the fact, been impressed by the fact that it was the midshipmen and cadets that put forth their name, not some dumb old professor or Navy captain. The dumb old professors and Navy captains get the last word, but it starts with the midshipmen and cadets. It's a tradition I'm very proud of, and it has been very productive, and we've gotten very good speakers. Second, at the time we invited Mr. Rashid, we really did not appreciate how the current events would change to make his topic here tonight so very, very timely. as sort of the number one button in international relationships right now. And so that was a fringe. 
And the third thing I'd like to point out is that the first speaker nominated by the students was amb former Ambassador Bodine, who was the first woman to serve as an eminent lecturership. Mr. Rashid asked me the other day at lunch, he says, have any Nimitz lecturers been foreign? And I said, well, we'll have to look it up. And we did. And the answer is he is the first. Now, think about the former guerrilla educated in England speaking good British English and yet getting sort of free access to the Taliban and in Afghanistan and Pakistan like nobody else. Things that the rest of us really can't even comprehend, let alone be able to do. So he is clearly bringing to us a unique perspective for a Nimitz lecturer. His topics are Afghanistan and Pakistan. Tuesday was Afghanistan. Tonight is Pakistan. Please welcome our Nimitz lecturer, Mr. Rashid. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, after that, I should just go home, you know, and uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, very kind introduction. Yeah. Um, for those of you who were uh, with us day before yesterday, the news today from Afghanistan, I don't know if you have registered, is pretty grim. Uh, the talks between the Americans and the Taliban, which I spoke about, have been suspended by the Taliban today, and President Karzai has told Leon Panetta, the Defense Secretary, that he wants all American troops removed from the rural areas and back into their bases. Um, so the crisis continues day by day. Uh, what I expected to be a, the end game and, and these kinds of crises would erupt in the, perhaps in 2014, are, are, you know, are already with us in 2000, the beginning of 2012. And we're, it's, it's really going to be a very difficult roller coaster ride. Um, I was, you know, uh, I do think the, the, the talks with the Taliban will get back on, 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 on schedule um, at, at some point, but there will have to be compromises made both by the Americans and by the Taliban. And I, I don't know quite the implications of what Karzai's statement means, because um, he's making it obviously to the gallery, to the Afghan public opinion, but by making it public, he's putting the Americans in a spot where the American command now has to respond that either we will withdraw all our troops from the uh, rural areas, or we won't, and we'll defy you. And um, he's kind of testing, I suppose, American resolve there. Anyway, I, I just thought you know, I'd, I'd add that. Let me just start on Pakistan by um, one of the last lines in my book, which is that for too long, the military and civilian elite in Pakistan have neglected their one single task, which is to make life better for their own people. Now, um, that may be true. Uh, obviously, that's true for every government uh, and every ruling elite. Um, but it's particularly true uh, for the case of Pakistan. Um, we've pursued, we have a, a very large military establishment. We've pursued nuclear weapons and got them. Um, we've uh, fought three wars with India, uh, wars supporting various factions in Afghanistan. But the lives of the, of, the, of, of the people, of the public, have not really improved or changed very much. Um, let, you know, and, and the core issue in the region, um, as much as Afghanistan is important because you've got 150,000 troops there, um, the core issue in the region is what is going to happen to Pakistan. Let me just very briefly outline you. A huge population, nearly 200 million people, with no one of the largest population growth rates in the world. Uh, a crumbling economy um, over a period of years because of a lack of investment, lack of infrastructure, um, a large migration of brains and talent to other countries, to the Gulf states and to other countries. Um, a failure to educate its own people. Our literacy rate is around 54%, which is almost the same as it was at partition when the British left India in 1947, which means that you only kept up with the population growth. Uh, you haven't really increased literacy at all. 
Um, India, by comparison, is nearly 70 percent. Um, uh, a constant military and, civil and civilian conflict, which has led to four martial laws, um, uh, about 35 years of rule by the military, uh, and the rest of it by very weak, corrupt, inept civilian governments. So it, it's, it's an awful uh, choice for ordinary Pakistanis, where um, you have a military government which puts you eventually into a political cul-de-sac, because there's no way you know, the military uh, to, can transfer power to the civilians. And when the civilians do come in, uh, uh, either as a result of a political movement or some kind of unrest, um, the civilians don't know what to do because they've been out of power for 10 years uh, and uh, they in, in, invariably they mess up, um, uh, they become corrupt, they're not tuned to govern effectively, they don't have the, 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 the people, um, etc. And lastly, the question of Pakistan's foreign policy, um, which uh, for many Pakistanis has been ruinous, a constant state of war and conflict with India, a constant state of interference and um, uh, siding with one side or the other in Afghanistan. Right now, we, have, um, uh, we are very isolated in the region. Pakistan has no friends in the region apart from China, perhaps. Uh, the state of tension with Iran, with, with India, with the Central Asian republics, um, and even traditional allies like China and Saudi Arabia have become very critical of um, Pakistan uh, uh, because of this whole uh, preoccupation with the uh, fundamentalists. Now, foreign policy has been maintained um, as, as, a, as a hedge against India, basically. And this is what the army has been obsessed about, um, you know, uh, for the last half century, and as a result of which we um, have an army today of 700,000, something like 30% of the budget goes on the military. Uh, we have the fastest growing nuclear weapons program in the world, um, which I don't know if we can afford or not, we, um, uh, but I doubt it very much. Um, and, and lastly, there's been the problem of foreign policy where um, the, 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 the military, the intelligence agencies, governments have nurtured extremists, Islamic fundamentalists, as a kind of front line to pursue our foreign policy. So in the dispute with India over Kashmir, um, we have allowed extremists to uh, be trained in Pakistan to enter into Kashmir and fight Indian forces. Uh, and likewise, in Afghanistan, we, we nurtured the Taliban in the 90s. We supported them. Uh, they used thousands of Pakistani fighters to, to fight in Afghanistan in the civil war. And after 2001, once um, uh, we had changed sides and we had helped the Americans defeat the Taliban, uh, we once again gave safe sanctuary to the Taliban leadership who were escaping from Afghanistan and they came to live and, and in Pakistan, and then relaunched their movement in 2003 from Pakistan. And as I said yesterday, of course, this has been the biggest bone of contention with the Americans. But simply at the moment, um, there is no relationship with the Americans. There's no dialogue. There's a promise that a dialogue will start in about two weeks. Um, but the Americans have also suffered because of that, because the main route for supplies, 60% of US supplies have gone from Karachi up the, uh, uh, the length of Pakistan uh, to enter Afghanistan. And that route has been closed for four to five months. Um, so, I mean, really, how, you know, how, how, how did we come into this situation? How did we um, come into this mess? So let me I identify for you briefly um, a set of the, of the problems um, you know, that we face today. And, and some of these are historical problems. The first is the question of national identity. Unfortunately, unlike um, um, well, like many ex-former colonies of the British Empire, we have not been able to, for, for example, in Africa, we have not been able to really forge a national identity as Pakistanis. Um, for many years, our national identity was forged by the simple precept that we were anti-India, or the Pakistan is anti-India, so that's what makes Pakistan. And, and there's been a failure of the ruling elite to really be able to bring all the ethnic groups, the tribes, um, and to have, have an even-handed approach to all, uh, all the people of the country and, and forge a national identity. That's, that's been the, and it's still true today. You have an insurgency 
out of the four provinces, you have an insurgency in two provinces. A full-blooded insurgency, of course, in the northwest, where you've got the Pakistani Taliban um, fighting the Pakistan army, and in Balochistan, where you've got uh, a secessionist movement, a separatist movement, fighting also the Pakistan army. And about 15 to 20 percent of the territory of Pakistan is not under the control of any uh, a government or the military or anyone. It's in the control of insurgents, extremists, etc. Um, the second problem, historical problem, has been the lack of a political, consistent political system. In other words, a, 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 a democracy where you can be assured that you know, power will be transferred peacefully from one government to the, to the next as a result of an election. We have never in the history of Pakistan has a government, an elected government, seen through its full time in office. Always governments have been, their, their civilian governments, their time in office has been cut short by a military coup. So, I mean, that's a fairly disastrous record if you, look, if you go back to the foundation of Pakistan since 1947. And there's been, and even today, um, the crisis in Pakistan today is largely a result of a constant tussle between the military, which is trying to oust the civilian government or trying to weaken it or undermine it or whatever, um, and, and a civilian government that doesn't respond to people's wishes, that is inept, that is corrupt, that is um, really not governing very well. But of course, um, uh, the result of all this is that you know, extremists and other dissidents can take advantage of this huge weakness. Um, Lastly, there has been this state sponsorship of Islamic extremism. I don't think anywhere else in the world is there state sponsorship of extremism, which would today be, uh, which today, of course, is called terrorism, um, um, anywhere else. Now, the problem was that for many years during the Cold War, we got away with this simply because um, Islamic fundamentalists were anti-communist. So Islamic fundamentalists were used to fight um, just as the Americans supported the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union, and we mobilized Islamic fundamentalists to join these Mujahideen and fight them. At that time, it was permissible. It was all right, because these Islamic fundamentalists were not attacking the local states, and nor were they attacking um, Western countries. They were attacking the Soviets. But Obviously, after um, the end of the Cold War, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the withdrawal of the Soviets from Afghanistan, things changed. And unfortunately, in Pakistan, things didn't change. And one of, I think, the biggest uh, tragedies of Pakistan has been that we never um, cottoned on that the Cold War was over. That you know, our policies had to change. Um, we had to become less dependent on um, uh, American aid or foreign help. Uh, we had become a totally dependent state. Uh, the Americans were the main provider of um, uh, aid and money and armaments and all the rest of it. Um, and we had become kind of junkies, hooked on this you know, foreign aid. And even after the end of the Cold War, we expected the Americans or the Chinese or somebody to be constantly bailing us out. Rather than looking towards our own resources, um, economic development, um, uh, and making peace with your neighbors, etc. And the tragedy of all this was that uh, it is even more, it is even greater rather, because Pakistan is in a very geostrategic position. I mean, if you look at the map, um, Pakistan has, is this land bridge between India and Iran, between the former Soviet Union, which is today the Central Asian Republics and China, and the Gulf region. And um, uh, so there is, there is the possibility that if you were at peace with your neighbors, you could be a, a, a land bridge for these cross trade routes for um, uh, industry, for exports, for the uh, import of oil and gas. For example, Pakistan and India are both hugely energy deficient. You could bring in um, gas and oil pipelines from Central Asia and cross pa feed Pakistan, feed India. Um, likewise, with electricity, with water, there's an acute water shortage. Um, there's excess of water up in the, um, in the Pamirs in Central Asia. So, 
instead of you know I, I, instead of realizing that the cold the end of the cold war brought all sorts of groups of nations together realizing that they could no longer depend on a handout from the soviets or a handout from the americans these countries were on their own so we see for example the huge growth and development in the european union the coming together of european countries and bringing in eastern europe into that we see the growth of asean the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. But there was no similar movement in South Asia or West Asia, unfortunately. Now, part of the problem was Pakistan, but part of the problem also was India. India is a country of more than a billion people, the largest country in the region, with a huge economy, growth rate, etc. cetera. Um, but e even, even today, as it competes with China, as it invests all around the world, it is not building bridges in the region. All of its neighbors, if you go around uh, India's neighbors, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, they all have some degree of conflict, either border conflict or territorial or political conflict with India. And India, rather than being this kind of anchor in a region where it should be promoting goodwill amongst all the neighbors um, and lifting, uh, uh, using its growth rate and, and prosperity to lift other countries in the region along with it, um, there's been, uh, you know, India really has not had a foreign policy which, which has done that. And, um, uh, and of course, the conflict with Pakistan over Kashmir, the territorial conflict over Kashmir, has really um, uh, sucked almost everyone dry. And um, uh, this, you know, it, 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 so it, it's, not been a, it's, it's not just been a one-sided thing, it's been a two-sided thing. And if you talk to the neighboring countries of India, they will all be complaining that India has never really um, been a fair and a just neighbor, even though we are, acknowledge that we are the smallest state. The issue with Pakistan is that Pakistan has never accepted that it is a smaller state. It has always sought parity with India in some form. So if India buys Mirages, we buy F-16s. If India has you know, 10 submarines, we'll have at least one submarine or two submarines. Um, and even though we can't, you know, we can't equalize with India because its military forces are uh, uh, much bigger and its budgets, uh, uh, its income is much greater, um, there's always been this constant race. And now in the nuclear, uh, now that both countries are nuclear armed, this has become even more dangerous because both countries are still producing nuclear weapons when certainly President Obama has been trying very hard to bring about an end to um, uh, um, uh, creating more radioactive material and reduce nuclear weapons. Both these countries are involved in, a, in an arms race to have more nuclear bombs. I mean, you know, I mean, the question arises, I'm, I'm not a nuclear expert, but how many bombs do you need? You know, I mean, you are a nuclear power. You can have 10 nuclear weapons or you can have 100 when you're dealing with two countries who are just, um, it, it's not that Pakistan's nuclear weapons or India's nuclear weapons are, are for, you know, knocking out the whole world. They're essentially for knocking out each other. And, and how many nuclear weapons do um, we need? Both countries have perhaps over 100 nuclear weapons right now. Um, and you can imagine the, the, the cost and the, um, uh, you know, what, what that has entailed. So right now, the Pakistan is in, is in a multiple crisis. It has, uh, there are broken relations with the US, uh, which I hope will resume, but I don't think they will resume in the way that they were before. Um, we, we, and, and of course now there's the Afghanistan endgame. Now, on, on Afghanistan, let me just say that, you know, after 2002, most of the Taliban leadership who'd escaped the American bombing came in, came in and settled in Pakistan. And at that time, um, it, the Pakistanis thought that the Americans would be leaving Afghanistan very soon because um, you got involved in Iraq. And Iraq was sucking all the resources. You weren't prepared to commit you know, troops and money and aid into um, uh, uh, Afghanistan. So the feeling was that you'd be leaving. And the Pakistani military kept the Taliban as a kind of hedge that the Americans will leave. The government that has taken over in Afghanistan, led by 
Karzai and installed, if you remember, at the Bonn summit by the international community, was largely made up of non-Pashtuns and ethnic groups that were unfriendly to Pakistan and were loyal to India or Iran or Russia um, and were not considered friends of Pakistan. So, for pa so Pakistan's estimate was that we keep the Taliban as a kind of hedge. Once the Americans leave, um, the Taliban can be pushed back in as a kind of, um, as, a, as a proxy force which will uh, do Pakistan's bidding and, and, and uh, be effective for Pakistan. Now, from the American side, there was no, re there was no real acknowledgement of this. Uh, uh, in two presidencies, uh, President Bush basically said, the only enemy we have here is Al-Qaeda. And you help us you know, find Al-Qaeda. We don't care what happens with the Taliban. And um, Pakistan did help um, uh, uncover Al-Qaeda uh, to quite a large extent. I mean, um, hundreds of Al-Qaeda people were arrested in Pakistan, shipped to Guantanamo, jailed in, in Afghanistan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but the big fish, of course, were not uh, Osama bin Laden, as you know, who was killed only um, last year. So, um, but, so, so there was this dual policy where both countries pursued a dual policy. America pursued al-Qaeda and told Pakistan to pursue al-Qaeda, but ignored the Taliban. Pakistan pursued al-Qaeda, did America's bidding, and got paid for that, two to three billion dollars a year, very handsomely. But did not touch the Taliban. And eventually, what, what Karzai was then, by 2004, what Karzai was telling President Bush and the Americans was, look, the real enemy here, the real destabilizing factor here, is not Al-Qaeda, it's the Taliban. And the Taliban have, say, sanctuary in Pakistan, and they are, you know, a, a, a big problem. And, and essentially, <coughs> this was ignored until perhaps the beginning of the Obama presidency, when there was, um, an attempt made by Richard Holbrook, the AFPAC, the special AFPAC ambassador, um, to try and woo Pakistan away from this policy. But unfortunately, um, uh, there was a, 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 it was a policy that the Americans tried but was not fully backed. It wasn't fully backed by the White House because you had this essential rift between Hillary Clinton at the State Department and the president and his people in the White House. It was not fully backed by the military. Um, because they felt that you know, they were just starting the surge with more troops coming in and the whole counterinsurgency doctrine now taking shape and they thought that this could be successful as it was in Iraq, this could be successful in Afghanistan too. Um, so you didn't have a really concerted effort to try and woo Pakistan. And as the end game has approached, what has happened is the tensions between the two states has only uh, increased because the Taliban have stepped up their attacks um, on US forces in Afghanistan, on Afghan forces, um, and, have, um, uh, and, and Pakistan has ignored uh, the US demands to rein them in, to, to, to stop them from crossing the border, to stop them from getting you know, arms and ammunition and all the rest of it. So, and, and this conflict obviously led finally to, you know, unearthing of Osama bin Laden, um, you know, living in Pakistan, very close to the military sort of West Point for Pakistan. Um, and, and, and essentially what has happened after that is tensions have exacerbated between the military uh, and, the, and the American government. And um, the tragedy I see coming out of the Osama thing was that there was really no accountability in Pakistan for that. Um, so, uh, I mean, many Pakistanis, most Pakistanis felt, well, either the military is culpable in, in hiding, or some elements of the military were culpable in hiding bin Laden for so long, or they were just plain incompetent. And, you know, uh, but there was absolutely no accountability in the military. Nobody lost their jobs over that. And instead, the military tried to divert attention by saying this was an attack on Pakistan's sovereignty by U.S. forces. The SEALs who came in were breaking, you know, the, the uh, sovereignty of Pakistan. And so the whole argument, rather than address the argument of who is to blame for this catastrophe, uh, it was all put on um, the Americans. And... That has been one of the big problems that, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, whether it's a military or a political elite, we, we have never really owned up 
to our own mistakes. Um, whether it's dealing with India, dealing with extremism, uh, dealing with the Taliban, the fact that these extremist groups have been maintained and harbored in Pakistan to fight against India, to fight against Afghanistan. A and ev ev everything is outsourced that um, if there is a calamity, it's either the fault of the Americans or it's the fault of the Indians. So for example, the insurgency in Baluchistan right now is being blamed on everyone except the fact that the Baloch have been totally uh, economically neglected for the last 50 years. They are the poorest province of Pakistan. All the social indicators for Baluchistan are the worst uh, in, 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 in the country compared to the other three, four provinces. But again, Balochistan is blamed on Indian you know, funding and secret training. The Americans in Afghanistan are harboring uh, the dissidents. Uh, the Israelis are involved. Um, and and, and I, th I think you know, what uh, my books try and do in, in many respects is to try and present um, a more truthful narrative to uh, the, uh, really to the Pakistani public um, more than anyone else, rather than you know, out the foreigners, but to the Pakistani public and say, look, this is what really happened. And this is what people, have, people say has happened. Um, but, but blaming others and outsiders is just you know, not good enough. And the first, first thing we have to do is to look inwards into ourselves. So I think um, um, you know, that, that sort of uh, is, is, is the summary. And even this conflict with the Americans. I mean, um, if you look at it, yes, the Americans are at fault because um, the Americans, and, and when President Musharraf was in power after 9-11, the Americans kind of took Pakistan for granted that, you know, we're paying these guys two, three billion a year. They'll do what we like. We can flood this place with, you know, about a thousand CIA agents and contractors and, you know, everything was kind of, a lot of, a lot of stuff was being done on the, under the radar with the, with the, um, uh, uh, with the um, hope that the Pakistanis, you know, they, they won't notice, and anyway, they're allies of ours, and nothing was really clarified. And eventually, this became too much for the Pakistani state and the military to bear. Now, um, so, it, 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 and now if I can, you know, just turn for a minute to Iran um, and, and talk to you. We have a very, uh, we've had a very competitive relationship with Iran over Afghanistan. I Iran claimed also enormous influence in Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the population is Shia in Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, um, 60 percent of Afghanistan speak Persian. Uh, they read Persian, um, and there's enormous input from Iran of money, of development, of, of electricity, of, you know, um, uh, et cetera. Um, so Iran has enormous um, influence in, in um, Afghanistan, and um, the, the, the Shia Sunni uh, competition, Pakistan is a Sunni state, uh, but also with a, 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 a Shia minority. Afghanistan is a Sunni state, but also with a Shia minority. And Iran has very deliberately, um, obviously, uh, acts as a kind of protector for its Shia minorities, not only in Pakistan and Afghanistan, but also in the Arabian Gulf, in Saudi Arabia and other states, which of course annoys everyone. Um, but uh, nevertheless, there, there has been uh, you know, the, the, uh, these problems. Now, right now, with the Iran and the nuclear program, the American sanctions, America has been urging um, all the countries in the region to come down tough on Iran. And actually, the, the countries of the region are very reluctant to do so. They're very reluctant to impose sanctions on Iran because they're very fearful that the, the Iranians will unleash um, their own Shia minorities against the state. So India, which also has a Shia minority, um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, none of these countries have um, really endorsed American sanctions uh, against um, Iran. And uh, they're all buying oil from Iran. They're trading with Iran, even though that's becoming much more difficult because you can't trade in US dollars anymore because of the American sanctions. Um, so this is also a, a big problem uh, for the Americans in the region. 
that any real um, uh, pressure, direct sanctions, global sanctions on Iran are not going to be effective because the neighboring states of Iran are not going to comply with this. And, and, and this includes India, which is um, um, you know, a, a very close ally now of the United States um, after the Cold War, when it was an ally of the Soviet Union. No longer, it's now an ally of the United States. Um, so, but uh, again, a fragile, you know, the, the real question about for these states, of course, is that, um, God forbid, if there's a war, uh, Israel attacks Iran, America gets sucked into that um, bombing of Iran in some shape or form, then what do these countries do? Because these countries are all allies of the United States also. You know, Afghanistan is totally dependent on the U.S., um, Pakistan, obviously, relations will be restored to some extent, is dependent on the US. And India certainly has got huge investments here. Um, and, and likewise, America has huge investments um, in India. So if there is a war, the real conundrum in this region is going to be, what do these countries do for um, uh, maintaining some balance between not completely alienating and annoying the Iranians, but also not alienating and annoying the Americans. And, and this is going to be you know, something I urge you to watch, because it's going to be a very difficult thing um, uh, for the region uh, as a whole. I, I fear any war with Iran is going to be catastrophic for the region. Um, because Iran is not going to fight a classical, you know, confrontational war. It's going to fight a guerrilla war and a war of terrorism, basically, which will stretch all the way from Lebanon to India, where Shia minorities are based. And where the danger is that, um, you know, Americans, Israelis, Westerners will be targeted, not in a military way, but in a, in a more terroristic way. Um, and, and that, of course, will make... Um, uh, uh, will, uh, quite apart from the fact that obviously the oil price will go up and all sorts of other things, you know, uh, will, uh, uh, will, will affect the, the transformation of the Middle East, which we are all hoping will go well now with, after the Arab Spring. But the Arab Spring could as well, could, the democratization of the Middle East could well come to a standstill. Um, and I think, you know, the very, the very big danger for uh, uh, any war which involves Iran is this idea that in, in the last 10 years, how, how many Muslims view the US and why this anti-Americanism is spreading so widely across the Muslim world is that what Muslims say is, well, the US has bombed two Muslim countries, attacked two Muslim countries in the last 10 years, Iraq and Afghanistan. And if it attacks a third, meaning Iran, um, uh, there will be not just Shia anger against uh, 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 the Americans or the West, Israel, but there will be a very widespread Sunni anger. And if, in other words, a very widespread uh, Muslim anger um, uh, uh, against the West for doing this. And uh, this, is, this is something that perhaps the Israelis are not so cognizant of, or, or they don't want to really look at this. But for the US, obviously, which has global interests in every single country in the world, this becomes a much more important factor about you know, whether um, uh, the US can afford to go to war um, with Iran. Uh, 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 and I think you know, why, this is why we've got President Obama trying to rein in the Israelis um, uh, and, and, and trying to push as sanctions as hard as he can. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to touch on Iran. But if I may just um, go back to, to, to Pakistan, um, I think, you know, uh, again, if you ask me for a solution, well, we really need a, uh, you know, we need democracy and more democracy. We don't need, yes, the present political government is corrupt, inept, etc. But we need a, this present political government um, to be voted out of office. Let's have a historic first in Pakistan. L elections are due next year. Let's not have a coup before the elections. Let's have a, an election, let this government, and I'm, I can assure you, it will be voted out of office. Um, let it be voted out of office. Let another government come. Let that government also be inept and corrupt. But eventually, you will reach a stage. A, 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 for Pakistan's experience, inept, corrupt go civilian governments are still better than um, a, 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 a military regime. Because military regimes lead you, lead you into this, into this cul-de-sac from which there is no exit. 
The military itself can't find an exit. And eventually what happens is that military regimes are overthrown by mass protests, and the, the whole wheel of democracy has to be reinvented every 10, 15 years in Pakistan. So you go nowhere. You just keep going around this wheel, you know, military regime, a, a civilian, one or two civilian governments, military regime. Then you have to restart the whole process of civilian governments. Um, so I think what we need is, is, secondly, we need a much firmer policy on um, the, the sanctuary that is given to uh, extremists. Extremism now, uh, Islamic extremism now, is not a card that anyone can afford to play. It, it, it's a card that should be put to bed put to rest. This is a card that worked during the Cold War. It worked during a certain, for a certain period of time. Um, it can't work in, in, in this century. It, it's something that belonged to the last century. Um, other states that have used this card, have, the Saudis also, some of the Gulf Arabs, have used this card. They've put it to bed. The Saudis want nothing more to do with Al-Qaeda. Um, they're certainly trying to um, clamp down on Al-Qaeda anywhere they can. Um, Pakistan still has not uh, really um, uh, achieved this. And third, we need a, 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 a we need peace with our neighbors, particularly with India and with Afghanistan, because really we need to rebuild this region, and we need to take advantage of this wonderful geostrategic positioning that Pakistan has, but which it has failed to take advantage of all these years. Um, and 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 lastly, I go back to what I said that. The job of ruling elites is to serve the people and to make people's lives better. If those ruling elites don't do that, they, they get thrown out of office. And that's what should happen in any normal country. And I hope one day it will happen in Pakistan too. Thank you very much indeed. We are, of course, open to questions. Yes, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering uh, why you think the Pakistan military and ISI, why it will be in their interest to make peace? It seems like given scarce resources, they're at a position where they want to continue fomenting things in order to continue their own power and financial benefits. Well, I think, you know, I mean, first of all, I think Pakistan is really crumbling from inside. And, and there's a trade-off here. If you want to support a, a, a Taliban regime in, in, in Kabul um, or uh, um, a, a wholly Pakistani-backed Taliban, uh, an Afghan regime in Kabul, it'll, be, it'll, it'll only increase the extremist trends in Pakistan itself. Um, you know, uh, as far as the Taliban is concerned, I think you know, we're faced with two choices. Either we facilitate a peaceful dialogue between the Americans and the Taliban, and between the Taliban and Karzai, and facilitate a power-sharing agreement which is wholly Afghan, you know. Or we try and manipulate the situation, um, whereby we try and install a pro-Pakistani faction of the Taliban, or um, uh, make sure that the Taliban who do come to power in Afghanistan are wholly owing to, to Pakistan. That is impossible, because Afghans are Afghans. Afghans will never be um, anybody's slave. I mean, we saw that with the Soviets. Uh, you've seen that you know, the last 10 years uh, with the Americans. The Afghans are fiercely proud, fiercely nationalistic. And even though the Taliban have spent 10 years in Pakistan um, that, and, and have benefited from the Pakistani largesse to be able to have that sanctuary and all the rest of it, um, once they go back to Afghanistan, they will not be the same people. They will be Afghans then. And I think that's what's important to understand. Good evening, sir. Um, you spoke about the dialogue between India and Pakistan. Um, how can these uh, peaceful negotiations begin, and what would these negotiations entail uh, specifically? Well, uh, you know, fortunately, I mean, the last few months, there has been a negotiation on uh, uh, opening up more trade. Um, 
uh, uh, India had granted Pakistan the most favored nation status in 1996. Pakistan has only re reciprocated this year and granted India the same status. Now, that means that there could be improved trade. Um, I, you know, uh, really, the, the real problem right now between India and Pakistan is not so much tension on the border or even the Kashmir issue, which has subsi subsided somewhat. The real tension is over their competition in Afghanistan. Um, the, the Pakistanis say that the, Indian, the Americans have allowed the Indians into Afghanistan and they're playing an inordinately powerful role there and training Pakistani dissidents who are being sent into Pakistan as a kind of fifth column. Now, the Indians say we're doing nothing of the kind. We're doing development and trade and other things. And like all the rest of the world, we're helping Afghanistan develop. Um, and, but there is this incredible degree of mistrust in Afghanistan. And as a consequence, as you know, the Indian embassy in Kabul has been bombed twice. Um, Indians have been killed in Kabul. And the Indians have accused uh, Pakistan and the, uh, the ISI of having uh, encouraged uh, Afghan Taliban to have carried out those bombings. So what we need, basically, right now is a dialogue on Afghanistan, which is completely missing at the moment. Um, we need a dialogue between India and Pakistan as to how both countries will control or delineate or limit um, uh, trying to clobber each other in, in Afghanistan. And, and as I said, that dialogue is totally missing at the moment. If that dialogue could take place, I think we could move then to other more contentious issues like um, um, uh, Kashmir and, and issues that are you know, far bigger. Um, but certainly, the, the, the present trade relationship is a start. Thank you. Notwithstanding the official and military reaction to the United States action with Osama bin Laden, what was the sentiment on the street in Pakistan with respect to the United States taking out Osama bin Laden? The street was full of conspiracy theories. Um, the first conspiracy theory was that this was all a, um, a, 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 a this was all a drama by the Americans. Osama, in fact, had died many years ago, and uh, on, only his wives and children were there, and there was no body. But it, well, actually, I mean, this was generated by the fact that there was no pictures of any body. Uh, the Americans didn't allow photographs to be taken. And as a result, people said, well, uh, there are no photographs, so there was no body, so there was no Osama. Um, uh, secondly, the other reaction was uh, 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 quite a strong anti-American reaction um, uh, you know, by many people. But on the other hand, there were many people who were very pleased that this had happened finally, that finally this kind of, uh, the, this, this person who'd also held Pakistan hostage uh, was dead. And um, uh, there was you know, a, a large section of the population, there was no sympathy for him whatsoever, and quite a lot of sympathy for what the Americans had done by getting rid of one of Pakistan's enemies. It, it, it was the state, the military, and the, and the government that was caught in this whammy of you know, one part of society saying, good thing, great, fantastic, and the other side of society saying, you know, damn the Americans for doing this, they've broken our sovereignty, they've, you know. And, and the real issues were, were, the real issues, the real questions were, what the hell was he doing there in Pakistan for the last 10 years, living in such a palatial house and quite safe and comfortable, and so safe that he didn't even need armed guards, you know. And that question has not been answered. Nobody has had the courage to answer that question. You're wondering about the conflict, India and Pakistan and Kashmir. Uh, I, I understand it has something to do with water, among other things. Uh, could you just talk about that a little bit? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, first of all, there is a huge water crisis in the whole subcontinent because of global warming. Uh, all our water is coming from the Himalayas and the, the Karakorams, the Pamirs, the mountain ranges in northern India. Um, and, and the rivers come out of there and flow into Pakistan and flow into India. And as a result of global warming, these glaciers are melting, you know, the snows are melting, the water is less, etc. And it's leading also to catastrophic floods where, um, uh, uh, you know, water, rain, whatever is coming down and uh, causing huge destruction, but the water is not being contained or controlled in any way. 
today because there are not sufficient numbers of dams or anything like that. So um, that's, that's one um, problem. The other issue is for Pakistan that all, the, all of Pakistan, you know, um, the, the, the rivers that flow north to south and um, start up in the north and empty up in the Arabian Gulf, um, all these rivers originate in the Indian part of Kashmir. And consequently, the Indians have been setting, uh, building a number of dams on those rivers um, in, in northern Kashmir. And this obviously has annoyed Pakistan because it has reduced the quantity of water that is coming into these rivers. And in Pakistan, the British built in, in Punjab and in parts of Sindh, especially, a huge irrigation network. So a lot of our farmland, the most productive farmland, is actually irrigated through a network of canals, uh, uh, and the water in those canals comes from these rivers. So if India is blocking water up, up at, in the north, the water levels for the canal, for irrigation, etc., is very dramatically reduced. And a lot of land becomes um, fallow or useless or salt-ridden, uh, saline. Um, and, and, and that is you know, now becoming a very big cause of conflict. Now, there was an agreement in the 1960s, um, brokered by the World Bank, which was um, uh, 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 an agreement on the distribution of water between India and Pakistan. And that agreement has, kept, has, has, has been in place for the last 40 years, except the Pakistanis now say that the Indians are building these dams, which is infringement of the agreement. So water is, you know, is a double problem here. We've got the global warming problem, um, and, and you know, huge areas could just be drought-ridden in a few years. That's what the, um, the, the, the scientists are saying. Um, and and uh, other areas could be completely flooded out, um, uh, uh, both in India and in Pakistan. And then we've got this particular problem in Kashmir. Yeah. Well, I don't think a, a, an Iranian nuclear weapon um, is, you know, Pakistan has a monopoly in the Muslim world right now. And Pakistan is very proud of that fact that we have um, the only nuclear weapon state, Muslim state, is Pakistan. Now, if Iran, obviously that monopoly goes. But an Iranian nuclear weapon is, is really not a threat to either India or Pakistan. It's really aimed at, at Israel primarily, but also at the Arab world to tell the Arab world that your domination of the Arabian Gulf and other, you know, the Straits of Hormuz and all that is no longer tenable. And the, the fear, of course, is that an Iranian nuclear weapon will uh, force the uh, larger Arab states, particularly Saudi Arabia, to seek a nuclear weapon. And where will the Saudis do, do that from? Because they have no nuclear technology, no nuclear capability. They could try and buy it from Pakistan either the technology or um, even a bomb. And that, of course, will set off an enormous round of international hand-wringing as to uh, Pakistan once again becoming a proliferator of nuclear technology. Uh, because, as you know, Pakistan uh, was a proliferator to um, uh, North Korea, to Iran, to um, other countries in, in Libya uh, in the past. Um, so, really, Iran getting a nuclear weapon, I mean, quite apart from what the Israelis say and the threat to Israel, etc. I mean, again, I don't think the Iranians will ever use a nuclear weapon, but certainly we are going to be embroiled in a massive regional shakeup um, with the Arabs. In t Israel already has nuclear weapons. Um, the Arabs will be then intent on getting nuclear weapons. And, and that, then we are down a very dangerous path because the Arabs have a lot of money. They can, they can spend it, they can buy it, they can, you know, um, uh, uh, they can use the oil factor uh, in order to get nuclear technology. Um, they can blackmail you know, all sorts of countries, the whole world even, because of the um, production of oil that comes out of the Middle East. So we, we would really be entering uncharted waters. Um, 
But I, do, I don't see nuclear weapons in Iran as being a particular you know, threat to either India or Pakistan. There would be unease in both countries, certainly. You know, but um, uh, uh, this, re and this region would become obviously very volatile. So uh, you've, you've uh, expressed uh, the strong desire that if a civilian government uh, was installed in Pakistan through democratic means that you should, uh, or that the world would be better served and the country would be better served if uh, it was allowed to serve out a full term and, and you know, turn over to another civilian government. That, to me, implies that the government would have to be strong enough to resist takeover by the military, which I understand is, is probably the strongest institution in Pakistan. And I would just ask you, what um, kinds of things would you feel necessary that would, within, say, the Pakistani military, that would uh, that would encourage them to 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 not be so quick on the trigger and take over, uh, you know, a democratic regime when it when it materializes. Well, you know, I I, I really think that the Pakistani military needs um, uh, uh, a leadership that is prepared to change uh, the status quo as it exists today. We need a dramatic change in the military in the military thinking. You know, we need to get out of this Cold War syndrome, which we're still kind of um, hemmed in to. Um, you know, and the Cold War syndrome, I mean the support for extremism, the conflict with India, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the continuing pursuit of more and more nuclear weapons, um, we, uh, we, uh, and, and a much greater focus on um, domestic problems and resolving domestic problems much greater budgets on education and health and investment and infrastructure and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, this, no civilian government, frankly, as, in, in, as far as I can see, is going to be strong enough or powerful enough to get the military to change um, uh, in, in this way. The military has to see the reality for itself and change. Um, and uh, of course, it, it, it doesn't want to because it has such enormous perks and privileges. I mean, it controls so much of the budget, but it, it controls so much of the economy. And, and uh, it's unprecedented, the perks and privileges that the military has. It's very much like the military in Egypt or in China or one of these countries. So um, uh, we need a combination of a, a, a better civilian government, more honest and more competent, and a shift in the military thinking. Um, now, I mean, you know, maybe it's pie in the sky. But, but I think if we don't get that, we, what we are seeing today in front of our eyes is a very much a crumbling Pakistan, an anarchic Pakistan, where we are not in a position to protect our people from terrorism. We, we can't protect the minorities who are being, whether you're Christian or Shia or Hindu or Ahmadi or anything, you're being um, hammered, um, um, you know, by, by extremists and all the rest of it. Um, you're not in a position to pursue a, 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 a pr pr provide an economy that is welcoming to foreign investment. Um, so I think, you know, both things have to happen at the same time, and uh, so far they're not happening. Uh, thank you very much. Question on... Um Post-American post, uh, involvement in Afghanistan, which is you know, somewhere coming down the road sooner or later, do you think in, in Afghanistan in three or four or five years will look like Afghanistan was in the 1990s? Well, you know, I mean, certainly if there is no political solution, the, the dangers of a civil war, a multi-sided civil war, this time, because you would have um, the Taliban versus the government, which is Pashtun, as the Taliban is Pashtun, uh, plus uh, possibly um, uh, the former non uh, the non-Pashtuns also forming one faction or several factions. Um, 
the, so if you, if you don't get a political settlement, uh, the dangers of the, of the government crumbling, the country once again dissolving into a multi-sided civil war is very great. Um, yes, so, so that's why, you know, at least on my side, I've been very um, pronounced in urging for a political settlement uh, between the Americans and the Taliban and between Karzai and the Taliban. And what I said day before yesterday, that the Americans cannot leave this country with the present state of violence and with the present state of civil war that exists. Um, because the Afghan government is not going to be in a position and the Afghan army is not going to be in a position to handle the situation in a post-American withdrawal um, uh, 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 situation. So we need a political settlement. In light of the instability of the military versus the civilian government, and also if you're saying that the military still seems to be captured in the Cold War mentality, and with the continuing building more nuclear weapons, what, what assurances are there that A, that those nuclear weapons are actually safe, and B, if there is an affinity between the military and the ISI with fundamental extremists, that some nuclear material might not either purposely or by accident, in light of bin Laden, was either left there intentionally or in, by incompetence, leaked out and then used in some terrorist situation? Well, I think, you know, the, I mean, the question you're asking is a question that has bedeviled um, uh, every US administration and is particularly bedeviling this one in particular um, and is really of, of great, um, uh, continues to be of great concern to many Pakistanis. Um, the military so far has proved to be a very disciplined hierarchical force. But given the strains and tensions in Pakistan, what you've outlined, the, the, not, not just the extremists, but um, um, you know, all the, uh, uh, the, the insurgencies in various parts of the country, sympathies that um, army officers may have to one insurgency or the other, um, uh, or sympathy towards the extremists, um, you know, or, or the feeling that the military high command is too pro-American or too anti-American. You know, all the tensions that beset civil society today are also inherent inside the military, naturally. The military is made up of the same human beings who make up society. So we are very deeply concerned about this. Um, so far, as I say, the military is, is, is hierarchical, it is disciplined, it is coherent. We've never had a colonel's coup. Um, like many of the Arab states have had. Uh, the coup has always been done by the army chief, um, and it's, it's, it's traveled downwards, rather than a colonel's coup which has tried to eliminate the senior leadership of the military. But the dangers of a colonel's coup um, are, are forever, you know, are, are, are getting stronger, you know, which is why we need to stabilize the political system as quickly as possible. And the military needs to get out of this, um, uh, you know, uh, domination of the political system and of our foreign policy. So I, I don't have an easy answer for you. I mean, um, I'm uh, acutely aware of your question. And I think anyone who's concerned with Pakistan is also acutely aware. Things are not getting better. Things are, things are not getting better at the moment. Yes, of course. I mean, of course that they would be um, extremely um, uh, angry, you know, and uh, it would have huge international consequences, you know, regional and international. I mean, what would, what would India do if, if nuclear material was lost in some form or the other? I India could attack Pakistan, you know. I mean, not, uh, uh, not a nuclear war, but conventionally. India would be very worried that that nuclear material could end up, you know, um, killing Indians. Um, like, no, so I mean, you know, I mean, that threat is, 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 is there. But so far, at least, I think the Americans have spent a lot of money. After 9-11, the Americans, the Bush administration spent a lot of money to strengthen um, uh, Pakistan's nuclear defenses, making it more fail-safe. We, we don't know exactly what happened or what the Americans did or gave. Um, 
but you know, obviously there is some, um, uh, uh, you know, cooperation there between Pakistan and the Americans on nuclear weapons, because Pakistan knows fully well, the military knows fully well, that you know they would be finished if nuclear material was to escape in some shape or form. Thank you again. I, I want to claim the last question. Are you an optimist or a pessimist for the future of your country? Well, I wouldn't be in this business if I wasn't an optimist. I'm always an optimist, you know. Um, I wouldn't be in this business either if I wasn't an optimist over Afghanistan. Uh, I, and, you know, I, I always complain to people, I, you know, I've been doing Afghanistan for 32 years. And, and uh, you, you can rejurgicate my articles, you know. It's like I, I'm repeating myself again and again and again. You know, every 10 years I'm having to repeat myself uh, because a new civil war has broken out. And it, but actually it's the old civil war with the same figures that I was writing about 10, 20, 30 years ago. The same guys are, you know, reappearing. Um, but, but if you can be an optimist about Afghanistan, I think you can also be an optimist about Pakistan. Um, because I think more and more people are waking up to this, you know, um, trying to, to uh, talk truth to power, trying to create a new narrative, um, trying to look inwards and to see the fault in themselves rather than blaming the Americans or the Indians or, 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 or whatever. I think more and more people are doing this. And I think, the, the powers of reaction, whether they be in the military or in the intelligence or amongst politicians, they're on the defensive. They know that people are fed up with, with what has gone before. And they know that what has gone before had, has led to this present chaos in, um, in Pakistan and has led to a, a, a worse lives for their children than they had for themselves. And um, you know, they don't want that to happen. So I think you know people. People want change. Thank you very much. Two two things remain. One one is I would like to remind everybody that there is, that courtesy of the Nimitz Committee in the Navy, a scrumptious buffet over at the Faculty Club to which everyone is invited. And the second is that at these Nimitz lectures, the Navy gets the final word. Captain? Well, thank you. Um, as I get ready to close the 28th Nimitz lecture series, I want to take a moment to uh, kind of tell you that, you know, as the Director of Military Affairs, it's our responsibility to, uh, with my compatriots in the Army and the Air Force, as well as the Navy and Marine Corps, to prepare our nation's next generation of military leader. And, you know, it's a solemn, it's a solemn responsibility, and we take it very seriously in the Military Affairs Department. And, uh, and through the gracious generosity of the uh, members of the support community that opened uh, the initial Nimitz Lecture Series, we have added new depth and dimension to that preparation. Uh, you know, particularly today, you know, with our involvement in the Middle East, uh, Iraq, that Iraq chapter is closing out, but Afghanistan remains on the minds of so many Americans, and particularly our military members. So as I mentioned on day one, I can't think of a more fitting lecturer than Mr. Ahmed Rashid to come and add that dimension that I just mentioned to you. So, sir, thank you very, very much. And with that, I would like to kind of turn over the mic to uh, Lieutenant Zundel. Uh, Chris Zundel, uh, before I, I do so, is, uh, is a great, great staff officer, uh, lieutenant, uh, associate professor of mine. Uh, this, he, he has done this very capably for the last couple of years. This is his last one. He actually leaves the Navy this June. So if I could get a real quick round of applause for Chris for everything he's done today. He did this all by himself. So I'd like to give him the microphone to uh, present Mr. Rashid. Uh, thank thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Very much appreciate the community support and, of course, the support of the University of California, Berkeley, as well as uh, the students, ROTC students. 
One of the perks of organizing an event like this is that you get to pick up and drop off the speaker from the Claremont. And not only do you get to see a beautiful sight every day, but you have a chance to have some good one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, one of the great intellectual minds of the world. And I can truly say, Mr. Rashid, that it's been a pleasure conversing with you. And I appreciate your openness and appreciate you expanding my view of the world, as well as uh, giving the students and, and the community members an opportunity to have that view as well. Uh, as a representative of uh, ROTC at UC Berkeley, um, we'd like to present you with this plaque of appreciation for coming out and being our speaker this year. Thank you, sir. <laughs>